time to stop spinning all of your plates and start pinning. Hello. uh, What is up? Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur every single Wednesday morning who's turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, founder and podcast producer at Max Podcasting. And you can reach me at max at maxpodcasting.com to save time with your high quality podcast. This is episode 149. And today's guest is Laura Reich. Laura is a Pinterest strategist who is the Pinterest powerhouse. She runs the program and course Pintastic, and she truly knows pretty much everything there is to know about Pinterest, how you can use it to grow your business. She's been featured in Social Media Examiner. She is a proud mother of three, and there may be some special guest appearances throughout this episode. And in this episode, we talked how to boost your business through Pinterest, how to optimize for search on Pinterest, and the clever, creative, and crafty benefits of crafting. It is Laura, the Pinterest powerhouse. Please welcome her. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with Laura Reich, the Pinterest powerhouse who already is like my favorite person in the world because I love alliteration. Laura, how are you doing today? I am good. How are you? I'm doing doing good as well, doing powerhousey, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> really excited to have you on. I've been wanting to to get on really a a Pinterest expert, somebody who knows their stuff in the world of Pinterest for so long as I did a presentation on it in college, my I believe junior year of college. Um, but I really don't know too much about Pinterest beyond that presentation. I, I bet quite a bit has changed since then. We're going to get lots into that today. But before that, I think it's really cool that you you kind of started your career in the graphic design space. A lot of emphasis on design. What pulled you in that direction in the first place? I mean, honestly, ever since I was little, I wanted to do some sort of design. I actually started out in high school and beginning of college wanting to do interior design. So it's always kind of been in my background. I've always loved crafts and artwork and things like that. Uh, When I started doing interior design work, though, it was more than just the crafts and it was more than the visuals and things like that. So I really felt drawn to do something different where I could be more hands-on with what was being created, uh, visually speaking. So then I started going into graphic design. Well, actually I was going to school for graphic design as a collections agent. (laughs) Uh, Super fun job. Uh, Hated it. Completely hated it turned into a virtual assistant online and realized I could do my graphic design online. And I did that for a number of years before I kind of got burnt out. We were planning on having our second kid. Um, We have three. Just didn't feel like I had enough time for the family anymore. I was always asking for more time to finish a project or things like that. I kind of took a hiatus to figure out really where I could put my love for design and what was working for my clients, how to be able to leverage my time better. And Pinterest came out. I have been on Pinterest ever since it was invite only. Started kind of dabbling in that and fell in love and went from there. And you hear a lot about VAs. I feel like more and more business owners are partnering with VAs these days. But I think you're the first person on the podcast who has actually been a VA before. What's something about being a virtual assistant that you think would surprise most business owners? Virtual assistants didn't used to be called virtual assistants. (laughs) Back when I started, I mean, honestly, back when I started, it was just really like a marketing assistant. So now everybody knows what a VA really means. Back then it was... I mean, marketing assistant or director's assistant or things like that were kind of what you would apply for or, you know, send information saying, oh, I could help you with that. 
So it was more of a jack of all trades. And I think nowadays people are using virtual assistant, but for specific things. So they don't just say, I need a virtual assistant and they need to do 25 different things. You think the successful business owners are the ones that are like, I need a email marketing virtual assistant. Like I am coming up with a strategy. I am writing the emails, but I need you to implement everything after that for me because I just don't have time. And so I think one thing that a lot of people don't think about is just because they say they are a virtual assistant doesn't mean they're a jack of all trades. It really means figure out what they love to do so you don't burn them out because they really do want to help and they really do want to provide that bridge for the gap for you, but they can't do everything. Yeah. And that literally no one in the world can do everything. So I think that's a really important point that you bring up. You're right. Like the more I hear about virtual assistants, I think it is when entrepreneurs get to that point where they really need help in a specific area. Yeah. And just clarification on that point too. I think one of the ways that I've kind of been able to structure setting myself differently, and I know other Pinterest assistants have as well, is if you are looking for that help, make sure you are looking for a VA. If you are looking for someone to do the strategy, do the implementation and do everything that's involved in it, then you're going to look for more of a strategist, which is why I say I'm a Pinterest powerhouse strategist, because the VA will implement, but you can't assume that they're going to understand the strategy behind things as well. Let's get strategic about Pinterest. Pinterest, it sounds like you were pretty much love at first pin. I and I apologize it. for every pun that comes no, out. No, please keep pin on coming. Pun. <laughs> you have been a big fan of Pinterest since day one, like invite only Pinterest, as you mentioned. What is it about Pinterest compared to all the other sites and there's social network sites, there's whatever you want to call it, just internet sites out there. What is it about Pinterest that keeps you coming back? I think really it's the platform and it's love for the creators. All the platforms change online. All the platforms are constantly making tweaks to the algorithm, adding in new features. Really what centers it for me is the fact that Pinterest is always focusing on the creator. How can we do this to benefit the creator? So any of those changes are happening to help us in regards to more traffic, more visibility. And so I think it's really awesome to see when they do a change, they say, okay, we're changing this because it's going to help you with this, like repurposing your content. You know, hey, we have this because we want you to be able to still be on the platform, create quality content, but also use content that you've spent so much time on. So every little thing that they do really shows us that they're there for us and they're there to work with us from, I mean, the dashboard that they give us for analytics and how crazy in depth it is to being able to give us a platform to be able to bring in more traffic to our website for free. It's it's crazy the amount of things that they give us. So there's the heavy emphasis on the creators, which is, I mean, like any community or network or platform should have that. So that that's like a, a really key thing. But when it's front and center, like it is for Pinterest, that goes a long way. What's been some of the biggest changes in how Pinterest has evolved over the years since you started, since you were like user number, you know, one or two, right? <laughs> yeah. um, what's been some of the biggest changes that have really enhanced Pinterest? I think one of the biggest things that you will hear a lot of people talk about right now is the fresh content rule. Back when I was user numero uno. Okay. Sorry. I I slighted you with numero dos. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Come on. Number one, all the way. Oh, never again. Uh, But no, fresh content. You'll hear a lot of people talk about it. And back when I was at the beginning, you could create a blog from two years ago you know, still have it relevant today with the same pin. You didn't have to create a new pin image. 
Now, today, you can still use blogs from years ago, but they're focusing on keeping it fresh. So they are really focusing on, is it updated? Is it quality content? Is it helpful? And then are you providing that quality image and title to help the person understand really what that user experience is going to be like? Back in the day, you'd pin one image and you'd just walk away from it and it would be done and it would be repinned and you'd get all this traffic from it. And that can still happen, but you also have the opportunity to create multiple images now for that one piece of content. So say, for example, this podcast, you could have anywhere from five to 10 different pin images going to this podcast, and that's all fresh content. So I think really having the user focus on what is being searched What is the quality content? How are you helping this person who is seeing your pin? And how are you keeping it fresh is one of the biggest changes that I personally love because then I know I'm getting what I'm looking for in terms of those things, the quality, the effort, the help, you know, the the answer to my question type stuff. You use the word search, which I think is super key when it comes to Pinterest. Can you shed some light on... The dynamics of like how Pinterest works as a, a search platform kind of as opposed to some of the other popular social media platforms out there? Yeah, absolutely. And you said it perfectly. Um, Pinterest is actually not considered social media. It does have social media like qualities to it. But Pinterest is a search based feed. So if you go to Instagram, you scroll through the feed. If you go to Pinterest, you're searching for things. And while you're going to have a feed, it's going to be based off of things you've searched in the past. So it's got a smart algorithm to know what you're interested in, but 90% of the people are going it to search for something they want to purchase, a solution to a problem, to learn how to do something, the list can go on. But they're using that magnifying glass, typing in a phrase just like they would Google or YouTube, and then they're finding that answer. When coming up with a strategy for Pinterest, you want to think about it more like YouTube or more like Google in the sense of how are you optimizing it for what people are looking for versus how are you reaching people and coming over that stall that they may have you're already past that in the marketing strategy because they're already typing in knowing that they need that solution or product or service. So you don't have to convince them anymore. They're looking for it. I think that's such a big shift mentally. Like I think a lot of people, I mean, I'm guilty of this. Like I often think of Pinterest kind of like in the same bucket as a lot of social media platforms out there. But when you say, you know, really you should think of this like a Google or YouTube, then it's like, ah, search like search is everything search is front and center there so it totally changes how you act when you're kind of a a creator there what tips do you have for optimizing for things people are searching for yeah great question thank you i get one every now and then perfect i like this one (laughs) a lot because everybody i mean this is something that you should know in marketing in general so even if you take away nothing else about pinterest from this platform And from what you're listening to on this podcast right now, please listen to this because it's going to help you in any marketing aspect. We need to know what they're looking for, right? To get over that stall if you're on social media or to find them when they're searching for it. One of my favorite ways off of Pinterest is to actually go to like Ask the Republic um, or Ask the Public, I think it is. Ask the Republic, listen to me. (laughs) Um, Ask the public because what you can do on that site is it's questions that people have searched for and you can figure out what are those questions by typing in the topic. So when you go in there, you can type in anything. Like if I type in infants as like a search term or you can type in If you can't tell, my baby currently, as we're recording this podcast, is six months old. So infants is on my mind. (laughs) But say we type in like baby led weaning 
that's something that we're working on with my baby. If I type that in, it's a phrase that I'm looking for. What it does is it brings up all of this data across the internet for you of questions that people are asking in terms of baby led weaning. Right on cue, by the way. I think we got a shout out in the background there. We did. She was on cue. She knows when I'm talking about (laughs) her. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, there's questions in here and they'll go based on words. So baby led weaning without. And so you get all these questions. Baby led weaning when they're not interested, when it's not working, without a high chair, without eggs, if they don't have teeth. And those are all questions people are searching for online about the topic baby led weaning. So now if we wanted, we would go in and we could say, okay, a product or a service like Pinterest marketing. These are the questions that we should try to be answering in our content. They're also going to have prepositions. They're going to have comparisons. So just being able to answer those things in our content is really helpful so that when you go to Pinterest now, your title could be, you know, can you start baby led weaning without a high chair? And that's one of the questions people are already asking online. So when they search on Google or on Pinterest, you can be found. How important is the title? Like when you're posting, well, is, first of all, is it technically, is it, are you posting something or pinning something? That's the first question. Pinning. Yeah, pinning. If you want a fun pun in my masterclass, I say it's probably time to stop spinning all of your plates and start pinning. Ooh, I yeah. dig it. And that's a that's a great image as well. <laughs> yeah. Now that <laughs> we have that level of expertise, when you are pinning something, you mentioned the title and how you can kind of optimize for what people are searching for that way. How important is that title in the optimization versus like the whatever the actual creative is? Yeah, so for Pinterest, it is a ver- a visual-based platform. And so with that being said, they do have the searchable element of your visuals. It is really important to have a title on your image. It is really important to have a call to action on your image because those are the things that are going to help bring them from that image to where you want them to go in that customer journey. A really fun analogy that I use all the time is I go downstairs to the living room and there are toys and laundry and everything everywhere and my husband's sitting on the couch. I could get frustrated and I probably do sometimes. I apologize, husband. I love you. (laughs) Um, But If I didn't say, I need you to help me clean up the living room, he's not going to know that that was my intention or that it's bothering me. So it's the same thing on Pinterest. If you have this great title and you put it on the image, that is super important so that they know what they're getting into, you know, what their answer is to their question or what they're going to be looking at when they click through that image. But if you also don't say this is what you're going to get or click through to continue reading or watch the full video, they're not going to know that that's your intention from that image and that title as well. That's an incredible image. And so we not only, you know, baby shout outs, but we have husband sitting on the couch shout outs as well. Heck yeah. So you get the full, <laughs> the full range here. Yep. I'm full of family analogies because I eat, breathe, live, sleep, everything with this family when we work from home. So <laughs> it's we've all got the it family. All. Let's say you're somebody who owns a business or is leading the marketing for a brand. And you recognize that Pinterest is really tons of untapped potential for you. What are some ways that you've seen businesses effectively use Pinterest to actually drive results for their business? One of the ways that's really effective, whether it's organic or paid, is focusing on the top of funnel. Where are you getting conversions or where are you growing your email list right now? If it is working for you, 
and those conversions are happening, then you want to use Pinterest as the top of funnel to send more visibility to that area. So if you have a landing page that is working like gangbusters and you're getting email signups left and right, then use Pinterest to bring in more visibility there. If you have an Instagram post, for example, that is getting tons of link bio clicks that lead to sales, then use Pinterest to get more eyeballs to that Instagram post. So visibility is super key. How do you know if Pinterest is even right for you? Like, are there certain segments that do like spectacular, I can't even say that, spectacularly well on Pinterest? I like that word. I can't say it either. So I'm not going to yeah, try to It's it. not, I think we'll just uh, <laughs> never say that again. That's totally fine. I'll try later, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, my non-biased opinion of if you should be on the platform, how to know if it's going to be a right fit for you, um, that kind of stuff is really to go to the platform and use the search bar at the top. That's really going to tell you if you search for anything that you offer, whether it's product or service-based, and things pull up underneath that search that you can answer or that you already have content on, that's my unbiased opinion as to you should be on the platform. Because that's really Pinterest saying, even though I personally don't believe in competition, these are other competitors that are in the same niche as you that are getting found where you are not. So you're losing out on the opportunity to bring in the audience that would better relate with you over someone else in the same industry. And so that's probably step one. If you're not on the platform, figuring out with that search, if it's beneficial for you to be there. The second step that I would say, I've seen really good traction and movement um, for some newer people on the platform. And even for some people who have been on the platform a really long time, but haven't given it much attention lately is with all the changes, go back to square one and really look at your profile and the foundation that you've set up for your strategy. Because even though people will find your content from search, there are other ways that they can find you. So for example, yes, Bailey, there are other ways. (laughs) <laughs> got Bailey all fired up with that one. <laughs> oh, I know. She was like, come on, mom, tell them. <laughs> um, there are other ways, like if they go to Google and they search for like Pinterest marketing management. If I have pins out there that are more focused on Pinterest marketing management, Pinterest has a higher domain authority than my website does. So my pins have the opportunity to rank higher than my website would for that same phrase. If I have that in my profile and if I have that in my pins, then Google and Pinterest play well together and you'll have a better opportunity to be found over other people again in your industry. So I really think that it's worth it and I've seen it in um, past students in my Pintastic Rockstars program, clients that we've managed where we'll go in and we'll just make some updates, right? And all of a sudden you'll start to see this uptick in all their traffic and all their analytics because they went back and they revamped the foundation or they set up a strong foundation from the beginning. And so that would probably be my number two tip is figure that out as well. It's funny that I guess it's not funny, but it's it makes sense. It makes sense that search keeps coming up. And so much of this keeps going back to like SEO and domain authority because you see it out there. Like if, if your stuff is cracking on the right site, like for example, Pinterest, it can really shoot up there even even above your own website, which which is pretty crazy. When you look back on kind of your Pinterest journey since being user number two. No, I'm just kidding. Since (laughs) the early invite only days, what do you think has been the most helpful decision that you've made about the way you use Pinterest that has led to your success on Pinterest? That's a deep question and I like it. Yeah. Feel free to 
pause for like seven minutes and think about that one. Let me um, pause and we can like lead up to that. What's that effect where it's like, bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Some, uh, a, a suspense sound effect. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. That's the word. This is going to sound really basic for the fact that I just said we need to lead up in suspense, <laughs> but staying fluid with your strategy, meaning don't go all in thinking that you figured it out because you're going to have the best titles and this keyword is ranking and it's just going to last for years and it's going to be like your golden pot at the end of the rainbow. Be open to change. Be open to testing and trying new things. Pinterest provides us a website called trends.pinterest.com and that really helps us with our SEO and kind of predicts what keywords are best to use and when. Um, so that's really helpful. But not only that, if you are stuck on just using static pins versus using any type of video pins or idea pins or things like that, you're not going to be able to reach as many people and you're not going to be able to utilize the platform to its fullest. So I think really just focus on the fact that sometimes things change and as long as you are open and ready and okay with testing, then you're going to really truly benefit from what Pinterest can offer you. I kind of hate this question because it, it does change all the time. So sorry in advance. I'm, I'm asking you a terrible question. <laughs> but what would you say is like the bare minimum of how active you need to be pinning stuff? to have any sort of success on the platform? Okay, no, I love this question because I go against the <laughs> grain for everybody in terms of the answer to this question. If you have heard anything about Pinterest out there, you are hearing all the gurus and all the experts say you have to pin 20 times a day or 30 times a day to get anywhere on the platform. Oh my God. I, I got exhausted thinking about that. Oh, it gives me anxiety. Trust me. I hate that. I personally have tested with my students and with my clients. We have a case study on my website goes against this exact thing. Pinterest wants you to be consistent. They know where on the platform or anywhere in their marketing or anytime they come out with Pinterest Creator Studio to give you tips and tricks, say an exact amount that you have to be pinning per day. So the way I look at it is if you are beginner and you only have a little bit of content and maybe a couple landing pages or maybe one product, try with one pin a day. If you are someone that's had a blog for maybe three, four years and you can repurpose some content, start at three pins a day, but really take the time before you set up your schedule to figure out where are you going to send people, where is it going to be beneficial, and how much content do you have that's going to be sustainable for you. And if that is one time every other day, if that is five times, if that is 17 times, that is where you start. And you do that for a full 90 days. Because then after that, I can honestly tell you, you will see some sort of movement, whether it is movement in followers, movement in traffic, movement in repins, you will see something happening that will show you what is working and what you need to do more of. If you don't consistently do it for 90 days or you try doing 30 pins a day when you really only have content for three, you're going to burn yourself out. You're going to get frustrated and you're not going to see the benefit from the platform. That is fantastic news because the thought of one to three per day is far more reasonable than like 30 to whatever, 6,000 a day. Like of course. It, it is crazy how much you, I mean, you hear it across, you know, like Instagram and some other places as well as of, of people talking about how much you need to post. And it's, it's very refreshing when it's, you know, actually you can, as long as you're consistent, you don't need to like bend over backwards and ruin your life posting. 
Yeah, of course. No, I, I had a client we did the case study on. There were two clients. They were different niches, but we did one that did five posts a day and one that did 17 posts a day. And when we look at their growth, apples to apples, they both were growing over 20 to 30% month over month in that same um, five or 17 pins. And we didn't change their schedule. We kept doing their same branding. Really all we were looking at is the percentage of growth from someone who was doing five to someone who was doing 17. And it was literally the same. There was no like spike because someone was doing more. There was no downfall in followers because someone was doing less. Um, So it really proved that, again, even though it's not apples to apples, it's the consistency and it's the quality of what you put out there versus trying to be everywhere all the time and like blasting everybody with your message. Speaking of blasting your message, what message do you have to blast for your brand, for your business? Uh, it could be your personal brand as well. That would take phenomenal shape in the form of a podcast. I mean, realize I just use form and shape and whatever. If you are interested in using a podcast to help promote, help spread the word for whatever your business is about, email me at max at maxpodcasting.com. I will help you tackle the three P's of podcasting. That's planning, production, and promotion. And overall, will help you save a lot of time with your high-quality podcast. Email me at max at maxpodcasting.com. Now, let's focus on creativity for a bit. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's get to inspiration and creativity, or as I like to say in every episode, pinspiration and creativity. Yeah, yeah people, hobbies, resources. This is ways that you as a business owner and, and away from work, stay inspired, stay creative. Not th- not that you have any time with your kids and <laughs> husband on the couch and everything, but <laughs> what are some, some of your favorite ways to stay creative and kind of unplug a little bit? Um, so I actually have a mom blog. Admittedly, I did not start this mom blog to be a blogger. I started this mom blog because like I said in the beginning, I love crafts. I set a boundary of when I work so that I could stay true to my family. And so my kids, every Tuesday and Thursday, we do activities together. They're home with me all day long. Regardless if I do a little bit of work at nap time or not, we will spend a majority of those days together. And so we've picked really fun crafts and DIYs to do together coming from Pinterest. And so one of my friends said, that's like 100% you and your personality and your agency (laughs) because you run a Pinterest agency and you and your family do Pinterest crafts. Yeah, exactly. Right? So we started a blog um, called Little Family Legacy and we do Pinterest mom fails. So I am not the mom that has the pristine kitchen or the great amazing photography I do fun crafts to do fun crafts and so the blog is to keep us accountable and always searching for a new fun activity to do as a family and then also just document what we did as a family and how fun it was and what truly honestly worked and what didn't work as a real life person and so we have a lot of fun with it and that's probably one of my biggest hobbies is I mean we have a a silhouette cameo we have probably glue for days (laughs) we we've done magnetic slime like there are so many things that we've done with all different ages I right now have a 13 year old a four year old and a six month old so we try to hit every spectrum of their ages and their span Pinterest really helps with that, to be honest. I mean, it sounds kind of quirky to relate it back to what we're talking about, but nice. that really is our hobby is finding fun, hands-on crafts from tie-dye to magnetic slime to bouncy balls um, and just working on those together throughout the week. That is spectacularly great. See what I did? Oh, that was nice. Yeah, good job. That's, um, <laughs> thank you. I'll be here all week. that is so cool that 
it like allows you to unplug, but also kind of gives you insights into the Pinterest world. And it's still tied to Pinterest, but also like in a totally different ballpark. So you've, you found a really cool balance there. Like mentally, can you kind of, do you just feel kind of like you're in a different headspace when you are, when you are doing crafts and, and working on your blog compared to Pinterest strategy work that you do? Yeah, for sure. I think, like I said, it it sounds really dumb, but I only have the blog to keep us accountable. Honestly, if I sit on Pinterest and go down that like black hole of trying to find what we're going to do, right? And I'll have my own secret board that I will keep an eye on and save things to, but it doesn't feel like work because it's more like just knowing like, hey, what is my 14-year-old or 13-year-old, excuse me, now I'm aging him. Oh, yes. Wow. Well, <laughs> if, you, if you listen to this a year from now, it's you're right the first time. I know, right? Yeah. But no, what is he really going to enjoy that will still keep my three-year-old intact? That's why I do it. Now I called my three-year-old my four-year-old and backwards. <laughs> he's laughing at me because he's right here with me. But Oh, my God. That, see, you're, you're a stand-up comic as well. Yes. Yes, I can be. We should start <laughs> that. <laughs> it sounds like you guys have a ton of fun and whatever age your kids are. I mean, it's it, the the crafts obviously has a, a really powerful effect. It's it's great family time as well as great creativity and ties back to business time as well. Yeah, it just really helps set boundaries to make sure that I don't get back into that mode of where we were when we only had the older one, right? And uh, feeling burnt out and not feeling like I did enough with the family. So it, it's a great combination for sure. And I won't say that I've been doing this for years. We literally have only been doing this for the past year or so. You think being on Pinterest, since it was invite only, I would have figured this out. I don't even know how many years ago, but we've really nailed it down and and really come together, I think, more so um, as a family in the past couple of years. Anything you can do to, to anti-burnout is a, is a good thing to do. 100%. Speaking of keeping things fresh, let's get to a fan favorite segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! <laughs> Appreciate it. Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. This is where we talk about a creative marketing campaign, something, something fresh that caught our attention. There's something with Loom deodorant that has really breakthrough and caught your attention. And what is it that they've been doing that you really like? Uh, I like the foreshadowing, by the way. My pleasure. <laughs> I think that honestly, for me, I I don't know if Facebook is trying to tell me that I need a new deodorant or what it is. <laughs> but so, sometimes the advertising works too yeah. well, and they're like, <laughs> "Do you follow me around all the time?" I know, right? Are you following me or are you listening to me talk? Or, <laughs> <laughs> But no, I think it's fun how they're not claiming to just be a deodorant company. They have hilarious videos that they are putting together that's almost like a musical. Um, it's a couple minutes long, but it's bringing in all different types of I guess I'll say feelings where you're happy, you're sad, you're laughing at something, but even down to the fact that like, they don't just say, come buy our deodorant. They say, we changed everything about deodorant. We didn't invent it, but we changed everything about it. So come check it out. I just think it's really fun to be able to, for something as like basic as deodorant, something we need all the time to put a spin on it and make it fun and really enjoy like what it is. It blows me away when it's brands with a product like deodorant, for example, like something that is, I guess you could call it a commodity. Like it's something that everybody needs or, or most people should use. Yeah. One, when you find a way to take a, a product like that and bring it to life in a way that's really, really appealing and funny and, I mean, even musical in this case, that's impressive on its own. But I think, as you were saying, that they kind of were really upfront and genuine about the whole thing of like, hey, we did not by any means invent deodorant, but this is who we are and like this is what you're going to get. This is the kind of like people and brand we are. It really obviously goes a long way. Well, mostly into people's armpits, but it goes a long way overall. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. You need to have your own stand up comedy show with all Thank your you. puns. This this is it, so <laughs> <laughs> welcome. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm like holding a like a, a rubber chicken. I get like tomatoes thrown at me. It's just everything. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I'm flattered. Speaking of unusual references, which, you know, sorry again, let's get to the unusual. So pet peeves, quirks, weird talents. We'll start with pet peeves. What's your biggest pet peeve? Um, I think on the personal side, I am old school. So if you are texting back and forth with me and I feel like it's easier to just finish the conversation on the phone and I call you in the middle of our text conversation and you don't pick up, that drives me bonkers. <laughs> we have been texting back and forth. I know you have your phone on you, and then you don't pick up. I'm kind of an old school person where if it's going to be easier, I just really like to just chat it out and be done with it. That's spot on because that somehow over the year, like since texting has become like the number one form of communication and phone calls have kind of receded, it's become so much more intimidating in general to talk on the phone somehow. And it's like sometimes it's just way easier to do that or it's way more effective to do that. But and, and I mean, I've been guilty of that as well. I'm sure most people have, but like, I, I totally know what you mean. Like when you're talking to somebody and then they don't pick up where, you know, it's not like the phone just like magically threw out the window. Right. And so let's take that even one step further. If you text me and you say, Hey, sorry, I'm like in a meeting and I shouldn't be texting right now. Or like, tell me you can't answer the phone. Then of course, I'm not going to be mad at you. But if you like <laughs> keep texting me back and act as though I didn't just call you, like, then there's a problem. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Or may, may, maybe you're just in uh maybe they're just in like a, a dead zone with the cell network. That's probably what it is. No, <laughs> I know that's very, very common. Um, did you have one on the professional side as well? Yeah. On the professional side, I think one of my things is, again, communication, right? I'm really big on open communication and transparency is everything for me. So if you're like, you know, we're doing a discovery call and you're like, oh yeah, I love communication. I need to know everything that's going on, but I want you to do all the work. And then all of a sudden we start working together and you like disappear. And like, I'm trying to get in contact with you about how the work is going or ask you a question. I totally understand people are busy and whatnot, but you're hiring us to do a job. And I just want to be able to celebrate with you when we have wins and if right. you were to be found, but yet you told me in our discovery call that you love communication. I kind of get like, I take that personal and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but it's kind of a pet peeve for me because I really like open communication. I really like transparency. If you are someone that's like, I'm not going to have time. So just don't, don't expect me to answer. Totally fine. I'm still going to work with you, but just tell me up front and be frank. Don't beat around the bush and say something you think I want to hear. See, Laura, we should have done a, like a purely communication pet peeve segment because there, oh, there I'm cool. sure there's, a, there's plenty within the communication ballpark. I'm game. <laughs> nice one. Game ballpark. <laughs> How about this doesn't have to be communication, but it certainly can. What is a quirk you have? Something quirky about your personality that maybe your husband or kids call you out for, but it's who you are. I am a jokester. No. <laughs> I know. I feel like that's why we're getting along so well. Yeah. Potentially. I'm a social ooh. We'll have to talk <laughs> after. I just can't I don't know when to stop. That's my problem. I don't either. I, I'm a social butterfly. I like to make jokes. So not necessarily a communication thing, but like a quirk about me is I make jokes all the time. I like to laugh. I like to, I think it stems into my kids too. They are always talking. We're always told they're the class clowns. Like, I think it's just something in me likes it when I can change someone's attitude to be for the better. Because I feel like I've improved something and that will ripple effect to somewhere else. I just like to be a jokester. I like to talk. I really like to cuddle and my family hates it. So I don't know what happened <laughs> there, but. I'm envisioning most of the time you're 
family is like laughing and making jokes and then you want to cuddle and they're like, ew, what? (laughs) That's what it sounds. Yeah, probably. (laughs) Yeah, I probably put the bad times. (laughs) (laughs) And then what about weird talents? Uh, I won't let you say crafting because you already kind of shared that one, but something that you're just really, really good at, but it doesn't really impact your business. It's just something that you have a knack for. I won multiple competitions that involved hula hooping. Really? Yeah. Ever since I was little, um, when we would go camping with my family or like in a talent show for school, I loved the hula hoop. I would always beat everybody for being the longest one to keep the hula hoop up. I would try different tricks with it. I'm no circus person. Like they are amazing. <laughs> I don't even know. That's what a hell of an image uh, circus person, but <laughs> I don't know what they call themselves, but I love the hula hoop. Well, that is, could not be written more perfectly. Let's hula hoop our way into some rapid fire Q and a, you ready for it? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay. How the heck do you hula hoop for so long? How do you hula hoop for so long? You've got to go back and forth with your hips. I don't know, left and right and forward and back. And <laughs> I tend to keep my feet wider than my hips. There we go. Ah, okay. So it's back to the basics. What's, I'm sure your kids probably all have different answers if you ask them, but uh, for you personally, what is your favorite craft you guys have ever worked on? Anything tie-dye. We have done 4th of July squirt gun tie-dye. We have done beach towel tie-dye with their names and duct tape that we pull off later. We've done just regular t-shirt tie-dye. I I mean, anything tie-dye. The next one we're going to do is water balloon tie-dye. Throw some paint-filled water balloons at the shirts. I don't know. I like tie-dye. Yeah, I feel like it's making a comeback. Recently on Father's Day uh, with... My girlfriend Dana, her her family, and my brother Andrew, we went into the city. We saw, like, as soon as we got off the ferry across the river, we saw, like, two people wearing tie-dye right away. Also, Dana's mom, Cheryl, had a tie-dye hat on. Like, it was everywhere. It was, like, instantly. Yeah, you're onto something. It's it's, it's never been more hot. Okay, so I know this is rapid-fire Q&A, but just it, no, go it for was it. rapid hot when I was little, too. I actually am <laughs> a white blonde right? And we went to Mexico and blonde in Mexico is already a like amazing thing for them. Blonde blue eyes. (laughs) We all had tie dye on. My cousins and I all had tie dye on my aunt, my mom. And from across the street, talk about quirky and funny. Some guys laid on the sidewalk with their kids and started bowing up and down. And they were like, bow to the tie-dye blonde. Bow to the tie-dye. It was hilarious. We all were laughing. (laughs) We all went away with a good story. I was like 12. Side note, I love (laughs) tie-dye. The mythical mythical legend of the tie-dye blonde. Yes. (laughs) There we go. That's fantastic. Hard segue to CrossFit. I know you have an interest in CrossFit. Yeah. I know a lot of people are kind of thinking about doing CrossFit, but it's it's a big commitment. What's your tip for staying with it with CrossFit and, and becoming kind of a one of those CrossFit junkies that like thrives on it? Just try everything. I'm not going to lie. I really hated it at first because I was not a fit person. It really kind of freaked me out when they were like, okay, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And it was like 100 push-ups and 50 pull-ups and The thing about CrossFit for me, though, is really if you get in a good CrossFit gym, they're like a family. So nobody cares if you can only do two pull-ups because they know if you stick with it and you just put your heart into it six months from now, you're going to be doing 50 pull-ups. Like it, it's just super helpful where you're at. So just give yourself grace, do what you can, rest with you can, and don't try to be as good as someone who's been doing it for years because they understand they were where you were at one point in time as well. That's so true. I think that family aspect and like that support system is why so many people like yourself keep coming back. Yeah. There's something about CrossFit gyms that, that definitely have that. I'm still friends with people we were in CrossFit gyms together with that have since moved or closed from, I mean, 10 years ago, we still get together and hang out. It's definitely uh, a family type feeling for the gym, which I think is helpful when you're working on something like that. Last one. 
we've mentioned a few of them uh, throughout this interview or throughout this stand up act, as you as we called it. But yeah. what is the most overused Pinterest pun? Because I think back to my original presentation in college, and like literally, we it was a bunch of dudes talking about Pinterest who said Pinteresting and Pinterest like interest all the time. Just everybody rolls their eyes. But you've probably heard a lot of them. Even though I use it, I like my stop spinning and start pinning one. It's used a lot because a lot of people are trying to do too many things and hold up too many plates. And so that's one of them. I think another one is the rabbit hole of Pinterest. Everybody talks about the rabbit hole of Pinterest or the black hole of Pinterest. They're like, hey, don't go down that rabbit hole and you'll be sucked in two hours later. You won't know where you went. (laughs) <laughs> so I think that's another one that a lot of people use. It's the same exact thing as uh, Wonderland. It's like the same exact yeah, idea. Yeah. Perfect. Fantastic. Whatever you want to call it. But Laura, thank you so much. This has been spectacularly fantastically awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your tips, your insight, uh, your special guests, and, and lessons on crafting and creativity as well. Where is the best place for people to connect with you and to to learn more about Pinterest from you? Yeah. So anywhere on social media, it's at Laura Reich. Um, my website is laurareich.com. In all honesty, I'll have you linked to it with your links too. But yeah, of course. If you are a beginner, um, I would say go to laurareich.com forward slash jumpstart. Um, and then if you are on the platform, but you're kind of looking for what's changed and how to utilize it better, I would say go to laurareich.com forward slash C, the number two C. It's clicks to cash. And that really, those two areas really kind of help you get going and give you the direction you need um, in terms of making it most worth your time. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely have those in the show notes as well. And uh, last thing here, final thoughts. It could be a word of advice. It could be a a terrible pun, uh, singing, whatever you want. Send us home here. (laughs) I will not be singing after the cold I've had. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Um, I think my advice for you is don't listen to everybody who says they're an expert and take it as a hard and fast rule. Even myself, I tell you what I'm doing in my business, what's working for my clients. That doesn't mean that you're going to do it and it's going to bring home the bacon for my pun there for you. Nice. Just make sure that you test things, right? It doesn't matter if it's for social media strategy, email marketing, Pinterest marketing, just test and make sure it's going to work for you. If we had the golden ticket, we would be given it out like hotcakes on a spring summer morning. I don't have that golden ticket. I do what I know is working for me right now. And I try to teach that to you guys. So just make sure that you, you just don't take it and run with it because you're like, oh, she said, if I do this, I'm going to make a million dollars. Whoever does have the golden ticket should write a song about it. Maybe even make a movie about it. I don't know. Just just a thought. Thank you so much, Laura, for coming on the podcast, sharing your powerhouse Pinterest professional productive tips. And thank you, Wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to follow the Wild Business Growth Podcast on your favorite platform and tell a friend about the podcast. You can also find us on Good Pods. You know, it is a, it is a good podcast. And for any help with podcast production, you can learn more at maxpodcasting.com. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!